Well, this is part two of a video thinking about the pushback of the world against the gospel, against Christians, and how it can be turned to our benefit. And of course, this is what they do in martial arts. They never try to stop a blow. They redirect it to their own advantage. And God specializes in this. He loves to take the things that seem to be to our disadvantage and turn them to be assets for the gospel's sake. And uh, we thought about the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 10, which picture the Christian as a clay pot, but in the pot there's a treasure. He goes on to talk about the ways that we get knocked around. And the idea is that as we're knocked, what should come out is the beauty of Christ, the manifestation of the life of Christ, as he says there. And uh, today, I'd like to continue this. We were thinking about the gospel efforts that we had about 26 years ago in Little Rock, Arkansas. But I'd like to begin with the words of Ephesians 6 and verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the idea is Christians ought to be militant, but we need to know who the enemy is. We are not fighting flesh and blood. And so when people in the world resist the gospel, they are being used by the enemy. But we should never be tricked into thinking that they are the enemy. We need to fight with spiritual weapons because we are fighting spiritual wickedness. So I want to think about a few more stories that occurred there in Little Rock to show how this principle that when there was opposition, the Lord turned it to good. Before the team actually got there, we had over 100 people show up. But before the team got there, some of us were there laying the groundwork Brother John Biorley had a few young men, and he had gone down to do open-air gospel work on the campus. And they had told him he needed a permission slip. Well, on this particular occasion, he'd left the slip at home, and they wouldn't let him preach unless he had that slip. And so he had moved over to the city center, called up someone at the house, and said, please bring that permission slip, and gave directions. But the two streets that he gave, I think, didn't actually cross, they were parallel. And so I picked up this permission slip and I just went all the way down university looking for the team. As I did, I came to the Capitol and there I discovered busloads of young people. These were the top students, uh, 12th grade students from all the schools in the state of Arkansas. And they were there for a special mock government program. And so I quickly went back to the house. A group of young ladies had just arrived from Michigan. We gave them a bunch of gospel literature, and before they even unpacked their bags, they were engaged in this work. They arrived, the girls were sitting having uh, lunch, and they began to talk to all these young ladies about the Lord, handing out literature. Later on, when they filed into the building, our young ladies went up into the viewing area. Looking down, they saw these girls sitting there reading the gospel literature. And afterwards, in speaking with them, several of them said this was the highlight of their trip. This was the reason they were there. They believed that God had a word for them. And then uh, we had some young men who were street preaching, and they had a a chalkboard, and they were illustrating the gospel, and someone called the police on them. And a fine African-American police officer arrived, and he looked at them and said, I, I don't know why I was called. I don't see anything wrong here. You're leaving access, a passageway for people to walk through. You're not blocking traffic, and I don't see any reason you should stop. He said, would you mind if I had one of your literature packs? And so they gave him one, and he went back to the police station. And in a few minutes, he called John Heller and said, Listen, I went down to see your street preachers. I saw they were doing nothing wrong. I asked for the literature. This is excellent literature. Do you have more of this? We need to distribute this to all the police officers here. And John ended up going down and having a gospel meeting in 
the police station. And then we had a group of young people over at the shopping mall. And they were out in the parking lot talking to people and the security guards came over and said, look, we're sorry, we can't let you do this. This is private property. We'll lose our jobs if we allow you to do this. And so the young people turned to leave as they were walking across the parking lot, the car pulled up beside them again and said, listen, um, would you mind giving me, uh, my mother-in-law would love to see this literature. She's a believer and could we have one? And so they gave the fellow a packet and they started walking again. And then he pulled up beside them and said, you know what, if you'd give me a quantity of these, I'd hand these out to all the staff here at the shopping mall. And so they handed over the literature and they started walking again. And then he pulled up beside them again and he said, you know, if you would stand over here at the intersection, just where the cars are coming into the mall, that's public property. You can stand in the median there and you could hand out a bag to everyone coming into the mall. And so he gave them a strategy for sharing the gospel there at the mall. And then, um, we had some work on the campus. We were handing out free water bottles. It wasn't fair really because we had probably three of the most effective women evangelists in North America. We kind of piled up on them there. And these women were just pouring out love on the campus. I think of one incident, a woman was working in the garden and one of the dear Christians came over and was talking with her and she said, no, I'm absolutely not interested in what you have to say. And so the lady kept uh, continued talking and then drew near to her and said, listen, uh, before I go, could I give you a hug? And this woman physically jumped back and said, nobody touches me. She let her teeth go. She was, she looked like she really had no interest in herself at all and probably had been through some traumatic experiences. Well, the sister kept talking with her, eventually snuck up close enough and said, look, I'm going to have to give you a hug. I'm a hugger. And she gave her a hug. You know, at the end of the time, the deans, the five deans of the university called these women in and said, you intimidate us. And they said, we're not going to let you hand out free water bottles anymore. You can't walk beside people to talk to them. You can't stand in front of them to talk to them. They basically shut down every other opportunity for them, which is against the law because it's a public university. But what the ladies did was they took that and turned it to good. It was just a summer program, so it was a smaller number of students. They knew almost all the students by name at this point. And they sat in a bench, on a bench together, and as the students walked by, they prayed for them. And one after another, the students came over to them to say, thank you. You know, other people have been on this campus to preach, but the reason you intimidate the deans is because you're the first ones who have poured out love on this campus and they can't handle it. And you know, as they sat there, this dear lady who had been so abused and was so, so hurting, she came over to the Christian who had hugged her and said, before you go, could I have one more hug? Oh, the power of love. There are more stories to be told, but I leave this with you, and I encourage you, Christian, to realize we have weapons the world knows nothing about. I've already mentioned this in other settings. When Joshua went out to do battle, he took with him his sword, and they sl slew the enemy. But we, as we go out into the world, we discover the, the enemy has already been here. And the field is littered with the dead, spiritually dead. But we have in our hands the sword of the Spirit. And when the sword of the Spirit goes in, the people come back to life. What an honor, what a thrill to be involved in spreading a gospel of life that brings the dead back into not natural life, 
but into the realm of supernatural life, spiritual life, eternal life, the very life of God. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And we need to realize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are spiritual and they are able to bring down the forces of evil and to triumph gloriously because God stands with his people in every conflict. May the Lord encourage you as you go out into the day to remember this, that the Lord has sent us on a mission to win over his enemies so that they might become his friends, become his children, and are born from above. God help us to, to rejoice again in the victory song, to go into battle singing the victory song and saying in our hearts, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs>